Well, hi there, it's Matthew Blades, the host of Learn From People Who Lived It, and we are taking on another short today. If uh, you're just joining our podcast, welcome. We've decided to take some of the 65 plus stories that we've gotten so far and condense them into these 15 minutes or less episodes. If you want the full podcast, which I encourage you to listen to, there is part one and part two with Sammy because there was so much to discuss. And you talk about a podcast that was tough to narrow down to 15 minutes or less. This was it. But here we go. As you know, we start every podcast with those same three questions. Your name and age. What story are you here to share? And then finally, who do you hope hears this? I hope that anyone ready to kind of go deeper in their own self-awareness that, you know, they kind of like me uh, have been in their own way their whole life and suddenly they're, but despite them, there was always this thing that was always kind of poking and whispering and prodding them to someplace else. And um, I, I hope that's the person that's ready to hear that to say, hey, you're not alone. Uh, keep Keep seeking. You're 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 in good company. So when I met Sammy, I, I was saying I was a, I was just a kid. Uh, I've been in my radio career maybe a handful of years, and have been given the break of my life to go from Erie, Pennsylvania, to Washington D.C. and work for a big radio station out there. And that is along the way where I met Sammy. Um, we kind of connected on a lot of levels. I think out of the gate, uh, there was a similar energy there. Uh, there was a vibe that I think lasted for. Well, look, we're still here all these years later. And although I know you, I don't know what took you to this place of, you know, all those words that you just put together there about destiny and being the creator and all of that stuff. So what we're here today to talk about is what got you to that? Because often there's there's something there that led you to that path. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I love to start with everybody's first 10 years. I think it gives us the best idea of the kind of the foundation that was set for you. So what was it like for Sammy zero to 10? What's happening? Mom, dad, bro, sis, where you living? Yeah. You know, and that really establishes the whole foundation of what got me to here. You know, a couple of things really happened. I grew up very humbly uh, in North Carolina with two parents that were very, uh, you know, my, my mother had come from a very prominent family that lost everything. My father came from a very humble, poor family who was one of 17 kids whose dad had died at the age of 40 of pneumonia and the kids were put up for adoption and the mom got 15 of 17 back, two were adopted away and years later were found by a sibling. Uh, So, you know, a very interesting, uh, dysfunctional, uh, you know, I say a glorious white trash upbringing. That's the way I like to, uh, that's the way I like to put it. Uh, Tell us how you really feel. Yes. Right. And yeah, but, you, but you know, what's interesting is because, you know, I've done a lot of this work um, of really kind of going down that rabbit hole and looking at this, uh, you know, uh, you know, what really set the stage for me was a few things is one, you know, my dad was a guy that was, you know, re- my, both of my parents are gone, by the way. So I'll, I'll set that context up front. Uh, but my dad was a guy that was full of rage. And uh, from very early on, you know, I got scared pretty early. And um, it was something that, you know, I, I lived, I was an only child. Um, uh, one of my one of my earliest moments of kind of retracing my steps is uh, my dad got very sick when I was around like three years old. And I remember just being awakened in the middle of the night to this commotion. And I walk into the living room and there's all these ambulances and medical personnel. And my dad is just kind of frozen on the couch. And, uh, you know, and no one really took the time to kind of lean down and say, hey, man, here's what's going on. Uh, I was just left on my own devices to kind of figure it out. And that was kind of a, a story arc for me through, you know, most of my life, actually, is that, you know, my dad went on to he was, you know, paralyzed and had to relearn to walk and all these things. And then he and my parents, um, when he came home, he wasn't the same. And then my parents ended up divorcing. It was a very dysfunctional divorce. Uh, and I learned a lot. You know, I always say I learned to curse when my parents divorced. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot of chaos in the household. So I grew up around all this chaos. And, you know, I spent my adult life as a, 
a brander and a marketer and a communicator. Uh, and people say, well, you know, how'd you get so good at that? I said, well, I've been training since I was two and a half years old uh, because I had to kind of figure these things out. And I got, and I lived in a world where people had, you know, uh, my, my mother was probably bipolar, but was never diagnosed because you never knew what you were going to get. Some days that you thought it was going to be happy, it would be angry. And some days you would think it would be sad and it would be laughter. And so there was this constant, like my mind was constantly trying to uh, calculate and project and figure out just for survival. And, you know, that, that little inner child in me just really grew, um, you know, some really big protection around himself. Yeah, you know, and there was a couple of other things going going through my teenage years. We moved into a neighborhood that was was a pretty tough neighborhood. You know, we were, you know, my parents now are divorced. My mom's a single mom. I'm being raised by a grandmother. We've moved into this neighborhood where there's there's this, uh, you know, basically a Hatfields and McCoy war going on between two families of kids that are teenagers as well, um, and they are. Um, just, you know, their, their answer to every conflict is to fight. Um, and, and they're mean and they're scary and they're terrifying. You know, you walk out of your house. I literally had a, a scenario where I walked out of my house one day and one of the family brothers is walking down the street and he goes, I, um, I just want to kick someone's ass today. And lucky you, you're the first person I've seen, you know, so you, you're, you're not only dealing with the, the family dysfunction, but you're also dealing with, you know, the environment that is out, you know, that's, that's all around you. And um, so for me, it became very much about, I did not like to fight. I was not a fighter. Uh, so it was, you know, learning to, uh, to be a pleaser, to say the right things, to satisfy um, and uh, being afraid to speak up, you know, it was really about this idea of if you speak up, you get hurt. There, there is a lot to be said for the sort of the healing power of imagination, um, especially when we're talking about like kids and uh, kids and adolescents, teenagers. Um, there's a reason why, like play therapy is so big in young people um, because they don't necessarily have the words to explain what the heck is going on in their world, in their mind, uh, in their heart. Um, but then when they pull out this doll and they say, uh, you know, oh, this, this doll is, is Tiffany. She has lots of friends and what it, all this, right? They're essentially creating this world that they wish they lived. Um, and I think to some extent, we all kind of do that, right? We can't, we can't dream for something and work for something if we can't imagine it first, right? So I, a lot of times, I think our imagination saves us. I like that, that. That was exactly my experience, Dr. Frank. So I love, here. I just love the way you frame. You know, and not me, I haven't told many people this story, but I get this job. It's like the dream of dreams. Um, and, and I'll never forget the first day I got there, I knew in my gut that it was absolutely wrong. I just knew it. Here I was at day one sitting on the top of the world. And, I, you know, they give me my desk. You're the third director of marketing and advertising for maybe the biggest radio station in the fucking world. And I go, hmm, okay. And my gut's going, this is wrong. Because I was That's still wild. in that I'm going to hustle my way to cover up the shame that I was feeling from all those younger years. I was still in that cycle. Oh, I, I wondered if it had almost as equal parts to do too with that thing that we can all fall into, which is I'm going to get there. 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 And then it becomes about getting there and, and you forget about the journey, right? The only thing right. that matters yeah. is getting to New York, right? Yeah, so. and that's what I, and right, man. I do believe that's a part of it too. Is like, okay, now what? Right. It's like, yeah, now what? It's like now you've now you've crossed the, you know, the finish line. Uh, now, now what? How, how did you get your head around this situation? And then please answer that question about how you think you did during that time when you were going through it all. 
Yeah. No, uh, I was a piece of shit. So I'm just going to say that out loud. Um, you know, what did it for me was um, I got really angry one day and I scared my kids. And I saw my father who I swore that I would never become. And there he was. There was that spirit, that energy. And it broke my heart. It broke my heart. I saw my kid run behind a couch and hide because he was afraid of me. And when I saw that, I saw that I was completely out of control. And I said, I will, n the fact that I did that once, I'm a piece of shit. I will never do that again in my entire life. And I'm happy to say I never have. Yeah, good for you. And I walk in and, you know, I was the only person in the bar and there was this beautiful young bartender there. And she and I strike up a conversation and she starts telling me about, you know, she shows me this picture of herself of this obese, abused woman. And I'm looking at her and, and she's none of that. She's like the complete 180 of that. She's like a fitness instructor now. She's beautiful. And she goes, I owe it all to the plant mess. And I'm like, what the fuck is plant mess? You know, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And she goes, oh, and she starts telling me. And I'm like, oh, that seems really fascinating to me. But I, I'm, you know, not my thing. And she goes, well, you know, the, there, there's a ceremony in Brooklyn next week. And the, the main shaman from Peru is coming in. And I thought, well, you know, I've always been a little curious that way. And I thought, and it kind of talked to me. And I said, you know, hey, I'd like to come. And, you know, the day it happened, it's so funny because I kind of was that I walked back and forth from the subway to the loft where it was happening like six times in my mind. I'm like, you're not doing this. You're not doing this. You're not doing this. <laughs> and then I ran into her and she goes, oh, you're here. Thank God. Come with me. And we went up and I sat in the back of the room. I was, you know, terrified. And then the shaman starts speaking. And I mean, just listening to him talk, I, I was already in tears. I was like, this guy fucking gets me. You know, I was, I was just like, awesome. And, uh, and then that first day, like, you know, I didn't even take ayahuasca. I took like sassafras, which is like a little heart opener. And I just remember like, you know, at that point, then I became that, you know, obnoxious, like frat boy. They give me, <laughs> they give me a little sassafras and he walks over and he goes, how you doing? I'm like, it's not working. You should give me a lot more. <laughs> and, and then, you know, and he, and I'll never forget, he just kind of, he kind of put his hand on my heart and just goes, Hey man, you, you're, you're, you're good. He goes, uh, tell, I want you to think about what you truly love. And I was gone. And I just remember, you know, it could have been two minutes. It could have been two hours or two days. I don't know, but someone came over and like tapped me on the shoulder and he's like looking at me right in the eyes. And he goes, you found your fucking happy place, dude. He said, you've been on perma smile meditating in the corner for hours. And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, because I had, like, I, I went like my very first journey. I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it was this, it just kind of brought up that idea of like, you know, your intention is your power and, and you have this power. You know, I had a great mentor that said the power to choose is what brings your life to life. And I never forgot that. And, and that was kind of the message for me it was like, hey, not only do you know that this intention thing has got real power to it, but guess what? You've already done it. And it kind of took me on this retrospective all the way back to that 14 year old that wanted to be on the radio, but knew nothing about radio. But then suddenly turned that intention into opening a door to be on the radio and then going all the way to the top of the radio business. It said, you know how to use this magic in your favor. And, um, and, and at that point I just, you know, started an exploration with it that, uh, I've done for, you know, that was 2014. So I've done it for about eight years now. Uh, and you know, the spiritual side of those plants are ayahuasca. They call her a grandmother, you know, it's a feminine energy. It's the insight. You, you come into journey, you come into ceremony, you bring an intention. 
And then that intention, you take the medicine and she brings that intention in. And then a lot, the way that I would do it a lot is also do it with San Pedro, which is a, a plant that is more masculine. So you do ayahuasca at night, you go in, you travel through the journey of your own insight. And then in the morning you do your integration circle. You talk about kind of what's happening and then you do San Pedro, which is kind of a, it, it, it's an opener. It kind of brings everything out. And, uh, you know, for me, what the byproduct of that was is just sitting in these ceremonies and watching real healing happen. I mean, you know, there, there was one journey where there was a guy that came in that, I mean, you, you guys know, you see this, this guy comes in, he's wound so tight. He's just, he, you know, and there was, a, and I remember in the intention survey, he talked about something like issues with his mom or something like that. And, and I just felt for him. You could just feel just, just how much he was hurting and suffering. And by about like two in the morning, this guy is dancing around like, like a fairy. He's as light as a feather. We'll be back next week with another short, and we've got some great episodes coming out this week, including a conversation with John Schufelt, who has accomplished more things in his lifetime than 50 people in their lifetimes, quite frankly. Cannot wait for you to sit down with us and hear his bit of goodness. Plus, we've got an alert, what I'm trying to spit out, is a learn from people who lived it story on the way with myself and Dr. Frank Bavacqua and a woman named Danielle who grew up LDS and struggled with some of the beliefs that came with that later in life. Uh, it's a really good episode, a really powerful episode, especially if you're anybody who's ever struggled or had big questions surrounding religion. I think you'll key in on that episode and enjoy it. You have a great day. Please tell a friend about our podcast. Make sure you subscribe, and we'll see you next time.